what to expect and it's hard on the brain. Yeah, the first test is always the hardest, I agree. Is that what you mean? Yeah, because you don't always know what that professor kind of expects. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So hang in there. <laughs> so we need to finish out this chapter talking about telescopes. So this will probably take us you know, right up to break time. I think it should be fine. And I had my telescopes all packed ready to go. But, <laughs> um, but I think this will work out OK. So it's almost like, like a misconception that um, those are the three main reasons that we use telescopes. Okay. Um, we, use, uh, we use them to make objects appear brighter. Okay. We want to see detail on the objects. And we want to be able to see objects that uh, we can't see with the naked eye because they're too far away. Okay. So, basically. so um, but my misconception part would come in where it's not, I guess, I was going to say magnification isn't up there. But to see more detail in an object, that is magnification, isn't it? I'm just contradicting myself. So we're going to talk about, um, you already, in the lab, do you remember the other day, we saw two types of telescopes. We saw the, the schools is, uses a mirror. So the school is a reflecting telescope. Get that puppy out tonight. Okay, and then the new one I got, that long one, is a refracting telescope. Okay, so refracting telescopes uses lenses, not mirrors. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk through those three different why you use a telescope. Um, uh, the first one was to see detail. And usually all of these, to see detail, um, to... Uh, better resolution. I don't need, the, the bigger the telescope, the better in general. And that's kind of what that last statement up there says. But I hesitate to go too far because the problem is when you go to buy a telescope, if you get one this big or if you get, and I'm talking about the mirror here or the lens, or if you get a mirror or lens this big, this one might be better if the quality is better, is my point, okay, than this one. So... It's not that simple. But if the quality is the same in both of those, if you double the diameter, then you double the details, what you can see. Now, I'm going to show you an example of what angular resolution is. But um, remember when we talked about um, kind of, do you remember we said that the moon, you can take your finger out, and, and the moon and the sun, basically, the disk is about a half a degree, okay, 0.5 degrees, okay? And so that is an angle. So when we talk about angular resolution, we are basically saying um, the more, the finer, and the finer, the finer the detail that we see is a better telescope. It's a better view, the smaller the angular resolution. So I like what um, your author does here. This is a cute little animation. And we've all seen this phenomenon happen where you're driving down the road, it's nighttime, and you're looking at a, an oncoming car, and you know it's got two headlights but you only see one okay. So this is talking about there's no resolution between those two headlights. The term is resolved. So you see the two headlights resolve into two headlights versus when it was far away. It was just blobby. Okay. So this would be a good telescope, good resolution. This would be, you can't resolve the two, okay, the two headlights. Um, I think it's the next one is going to actually switch from cars to a pair of stars. Okay. So um, I'm going to show you this one over here. One of the beautiful things about stars is that oftentimes stars don't have to be alone. They like have a buddy. They are gravitationally, they ha they're, they're paired up in twos or even threes, gravitationally hanging out together. They're called double stars. So it looks like the blob, okay, here, that's like, um, like a, the distant vehicle with actually two headlights. Looks like just one, head, one light. Okay. So um, 
What we can play around with down here is the diameter of the telescope. This is one tenth of a meter, so that'd be pretty small. Okay. So I'm going to up the diameter of the telescope. Okay. And you saw the blob kind of become tighter. Okay. I'm be able to resolve my better. Okay. And let's up the diameter. It started out 0.1. Let's go to one. Okay, and already you can start to kind of make out. Now, there's a, how do I say, some nights when you look through a telescope, the seeing is better than others. And what the seeing means is stuff your telescope has nothing to do with. Basically, it's the atmosphere kind of doing its own little thing. It looks clear, but you might have moisture up there. You might have kind of some sort of turbulence. And so you look through a telescope and you're like, dude, I know there's two there, but I can just barely make them out. Well, Let's go ahead and increase the size of the mirror or the lens, okay? Better? It's like you go to an eye doctor and they say, better? Worse, okay? Okay, but you see now I'm up to two and a half meters, okay? Three meters, four and a half meters, five and a half meters, wow. 6.7 meters, okay. So you might be like, and I'll go ahead and dim the lights, you might be like, well, I preferred one of those other ones where they had a little bit of head to them. <laughs> okay, but that's a case where you have a 10 meter, 10 meters, so let's think of like 10 meters. There's about three feet, so that's about 30 feet, right? So tonight, um, on things to view, I have um, listed, um, you guys know one of the stars in the summer triangle is Vega, okay, and uh, Vega, sorry, <coughs> Vega is a member of the constellation Lyra, the little harp thingy, Lyra, and there is a star called Epsilon Lyra that's actually a quartet, okay, if you look just with Depending on what kind of resolution you have, you might see one star. You go ahead and look through a telescope that can go ahead and divide them into two stars. And then if you, the seeing is good and if you have a nice telescope, actually these two divide into each pair. So it's a quartet. Angular resolution. So we have telescopes that use mirrors and telescopes that use lenses. And I just kind of want to backtrack or mention why do we call the telescope that uses lenses, why do we call them refractors? And the term refraction means that as light passes through that lens, refraction means to bend. So refraction occurs as light or any sort of um, cousin of light, because remember we talked about cousins, you know, all the way from radio waves to gamma rays. Um, uh, light is refracted as it, if, as it goes through, you see up here, uh, a change in medium. So let me show you the change in medium. It goes from air to glass. And do you see the trajectory being bent? Okay, that's refraction. Then it goes from glass back to air, and it's bent one more time, refraction. Okay, so refraction means to bend the trajectory of the light. Now, our lenses aren't like this, because that wouldn't get us anywhere, okay, for our telescope. But if we go ahead and make the shape of the lens what's called, I call it a double convex, double convex. And uh, that's because... Um, the way I think of it anyway, and my background's in chemistry, not physics, but the way I think of it is um, it's kind of a bowing out, okay? So that's what we call convex. So basically light, just like over here, travels through kind of three mediums, 
air to glass to air. Okay, and based upon how this is ground, like Benjamin Franklin did that. Didn't he create like spectacles? I don't know if that's a, a urban legend or not. But um, basically the light comes in, is bent, and it's bent one more time, and it goes to what's called a focal point. I think I mentioned this before. If you've ever like taken a magnifying glass, which is kind of this shape, and in the sun tried to kind of start a fire, okay, or kill ants, what you try to do is basically judge the distance, the focal length of that particular lens to concentrate all the light to one point. So refracting telescopes. This is the largest refracting telescope. Um, it's 40, no, 40 the largest refracting telescope. Now, in that little, that little animation, that little applet, we, we bumped up the size to, like, was it 10 meters? 10 meters, yeah. So it could have been a refracting telescope. The problem with a lens that's made out of glass is if you ever seen old houses and their, their, win, their window panes kind of look like they're, they're kind of like they're distorted. Okay, so over time, glass will kind of distort its shape. So if you get it too big, then that's what you're going to be facing with isn't your... There, isn't that the same lead glass or something? Could, oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I don't know if the lead glass is worse for doing that or... But all glass will kind of... Gravity kicks in and... So there's a limitation to the size and one meter is it. So um, this is actually outside Chicago. It's kind of north of Chicago-ish. Okay, and you get credit for going here. I'm just saying. Oof. Oops, let me go back. <clears throat> oh. I thought I had a picture. It's not sure not showing it, is it? Oh, okay, let me do this. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, I'm not hooked up to the internet right now. But what that would have shown you is actually Einstein has looked through that telescope. There's a picture, a famous picture out there with Einstein in front of this very telescope, 1921, along with his buds. So, um, yeah. So can you see the light being um, brought back to a focal point right there? Okay. And then we put an eyepiece right here to what I say kind of unpack that information. Okay, so we have refracting telescopes use, use lenses to refract light back to a focal point. And then reflecting, of course, you think of reflection, you think of mirrors. So reflecting telescopes use mirrors. And the deal about that is their light is, comes to a focal point also. But it comes to a focal point in front. Okay, so the light comes through, just like you see here. The light comes through, it hits the back of the telescope where your mirror is, and then that light is brought, brought back to a focal point in front of the mirror. Okay, so we have star, mirror, focal point. Okay, and the shape of the mirror now is a concave. Okay, so the thing about that is we don't have to worry about sagging. We don't have to worry about distortion because, honestly, with regard to quality, okay, this is glass, okay, and the glass has a mirrored surface, mirrored surface. Okay, so this glass can be crap <laughs> as long as the shape's good, okay, but of course you need to be careful with your mirrored surface. Okay, um, to get this shape, this, I called it concave. It's specifically, it should be the shape of a, a parabola. And that's kind of hard. It's easier to get a spherical shape. Um, so there can be some corrections that need to be done for that. But there's the focal point. And here's an example of a reflecting telescope. So there's kind of an assortment of ways to handle with the reflecting telescope, there's certain there's an assortment of ways to handle the information that's brought back to the focal point. 
This particular design actually is called a Casa Green, and that might sound familiar because um, the school's is a Casa Green. The school's has a Schmidt. Let's see, Schmidt. The school's has a Schmidt correcting plate, but it's this design. Because if you remember, like tonight if we're out there, basically we have the back of the telescope that has the mirror, and then we have a hole through the back. Okay. So basically the light comes through the tube, Okay. It goes back up to a little belly button, secondary mirror, and then back through the tube again. Okay. So that's called a, a, a Cassegrain design. So that's kind of what that is. Eight meters. Let's pick. This is also big. <laughs> see the little man in there. And can you kind of see the segments here? These kind of... Um, what are they, uh, eight-sided, six-sided, little six-sided um, hexagonals there that are mirrored surfaces that together make the parabola. So they can segment the dark. So this is in Hawaii. Uh, you can get credit for going here, too. <laughs> the Keck uh, Twin Keck Observatories. But it looks like there's more than just the twins up here, doesn't it? You know, for being like in the middle of the ocean, um, Hawaii is known for its dry, clear skies. It's just the strangest. Okay. And it, of course, if you climb a mountain, then you're getting thinner air, which is good because less atmosphere, less turbulence. So, yeah. So, cousins. Think cousins. I think this might be my first semester to focus on that one. And I'm sure I'm overusing it. But when we talked about different types of electromagnetic radiation, we said that light is like this, okay? Then we have longer wavelengths, of course, then we go um, infrared, uh, microwaves, radio waves, okay, longer. Then we had the shorter ones, um, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. Well, we need to be able to kind of get information, we need to have telescopes that look at those different wavelengths. And this telescope is looking at um, radio waves. So, and it's a type of reflecting telescope. Can you see where it's got, does it look like the focal point might be hovering over here? Okay, gathering that information from this dish. It's kind of like a satellite dish, doesn't it? So here's where I kind of interjected one slide. Um, kind of some suggestions if you're thinking about getting your own telescope. Okay, one is to, and my friends kind of push this. Me, I like the telescope. <laughs> but you might try binoculars because there's a heck of a lot of things you can see with binoculars. Those sky maps that I've been giving you for each month, um, there's like a binocular section. So it's a thought. The good thing about binoculars is you start to kind of say, in order to use your binoculars, because it's not a go-to. <laughs> in order to use your binoculars, you have to kind of familiarize yourself with, this, with the constellations. And that's called star hopping. So basically what it is, is you see star A and star B, and you know it's a part of this constellation. And what you want is kind of halfway between those two stars, star hopping. I tell you, at the observatory, those people are really good at it. I have friends that are really good at it. Okay, me, go-to. <laughs> Okay, and I mentioned the thing about, um, you know, we're all kind of uh, stuck on what the box says with regard to magnification. You know, be careful with that. Magnification is really kind of a function of which eyepiece you throw in there. And I think I kind of showed you eyepieces that one night. Um, the diameter, okay, that would be kind of what I've been saying here, okay. Size, the diameter is important, the quality is important, portability is important. I kind of giggle because I have friends that have really big telescopes. You're like, dude, are you going to be getting that out when you're like Sally me? So, I don't know. <laughs> um, and just do your research. Um, I'll throw up here a um, uh, couple places. Um, Orion. I think if you go to Orion.com, it'll send you to something called telescopes.com. Don't worry, it's like the same thing. But the other, and I don't have their, their um, 
their website, but I got my stuff from OPT um, Corporation, and they're out of California. They're smaller. OPT is smaller than Orion, but um, I had really good, good experience with them. All right. Cool. The Hubble Space Telescope. another website, isn't it? Okay. So now I'm going to kind of sh talk about those telescopes that are not tethered to the Earth. They're telescopes, they're not wandering either. <laughs> okay, the telescopes that have been put in orbit, okay, to orbit the Earth. And the Hubble Space Telescope is one of those. Um, and it's got an awesome story of going up and having its optics a little off. And so when it sent back pictures for the first time, it's like, oh my gosh, they really sucked. They really did, if you go back and look at the history. Um, and um, Carl Sagan, one of my heroes, um, actually was like, hey, public, just chillax. We can fix this. And so they spent, they, they sent um, the, one of the space shuttle missions up there to, to insert something to correct its optics. <laughs> so ever since it just sends it's just beautiful pictures. No more servicing though. So um, it's kind of going to do what it's going to do, and entropy sets in, and it won't last forever. You see this little shield here. This is to kind of uh, protect its innards if they're if the sun like <laughs> sends something bad its way, so it can kind of protect its inside. So it's the Hubble Space Telescope. So what this slide says is why do we put um, why do we go ahead and, and send a telescope out there? And um, this would be, uh, this would be inc inc it would be incorrect to say the reason we do that is to get just a little bit closer to those celestial objects because you're not talking very far, you know, you're not getting much closer. The best answer is listed there because in orbit then we don't have the light pollution, we don't have the Earth's atmosphere giving us turbulence and um, blocking some forms of radiation. So light pollution is a problem. Um, kind of for my own enjoyment, getting ready for this class, this lecture, uh, the International Space Station has, set, has taken some beautiful shots of aurora. The International Space Station is uh, basically, it's an international endeavor, sending astronauts up there, and it's orbiting the Earth every, let's say, 90 minutes. So, um, hour and a half. But the thing is, is we have a lot of light pollution. The International Dark Skies Association, or the ID, is it SA or IDA, I think, um, they will tell you that too much light pollution is not just annoying if you're trying to look at the sky, but um, it's, it's a circadian rhythm, I want to say. Basically, um, humans were not meant to have all of the the light stimulation that we have on an ongoing basis. So our lot work, it's messed up. <laughs> um, not just human beings, but cute little turtles and, and and other like critters, you know, with too much light, it's like, it really kind of puts their health in jeopardy. Um, oh, there it is. I guess I did bring it in. So that's a, just a kind of a blow up of all the lights, I know. Okay. Um, so, kind of from left to right, um, of course you guys would say the, the right photo is better, okay, and that was taken from Hubble. The same um, field of view uh, taken from a, a land-based telescope over there on the left, okay, um, because the, Earth, uh, the Earth's atmosphere causes twinkling or turbulence. And then the last thing is that the Earth's atmosphere blocks incoming radiation. So I like this uh, figure from your textbook um, for a number of reasons. One is I just think it's so adorable. You see across the top there, well, first off, you see the cousins, the gamma rays, x-rays, okay? And this kind of emphasizes that we are looking for, and I'll kind of put check marks, all of those check marks at the top there, those are all cute little telescopes that are orbiting the Earth. 
to look for radiation in that particular wavelength. Okay, and kind of earlier in this chapter, we said what would be helpful about understanding the radio signals that the universe is sending us. Okay, one is actually we can understand the background hiss from the Big Bang in this region, the electromagnetic spectrum. So the way you read this is um, if these, if you had a telescope on the ground, can you see where um, the, that actually these rays are not going to reach the ground? They're blocked in general, these harmful rays actually. Okay, so kind of going across here, you kind of see what sort of energies do reach the ground. All right, so I think this was probably on the previous slide, but the Chandra um, Observatory takes pictures in the X-ray region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And there's a close-up of Chandra. So another thing, and this is back, this is leaving orbit, this is back to telescopes on land. We can go ahead and try to combat the Earth's atmosphere if we equip the land-based telescopes with what's called adaptive optics. So adaptive optics are pretty cool. Basically, you saw that segmented mirror, that the segmented telescope, the, the telescope with the segmented mirrors, okay? <laughs> so I kind of think of that sort of design. And basically what they do is send up a signal, probably some sort of laser, and they look to see how that laser light is being affected by the Earth's atmosphere. And that detection then is sent back to um, a command to basically change the shape of the mirror, just likely to correct for that. It's amazing. I know. So you can kind of see the resolution, right? You can see two, image, two objects resolved using adaptive objects. So the adaptive changes the shape of the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. It changes the shape of the mirror. So again, kind of from left to right, the right one is with adaptive optics. Neptune, which we might see tonight. Yep, I'm just saying. And this is one of the Galilean moons in orbit about Jupiter, it's Io. Should start to kind of see some features. It's kind of popped with, um, which is pretty impressive, uh, looking at that little um, moon of Jupiter from from this from the Earth. Impressive. Then there's a technique called interferometry. And if somebody says their 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 telescopes use interferometry, think of kind of like a like you see here an assortment of telescopes all working together looking at the same object and combining their signals. So one of the problems with big wavelengths, big cousins, um, like um, radio waves, is that if you're going to try to get one complete cycle, I mean, you saw how big that one radio telescope was, okay? You're, you're talking large. So kind of a way around that is to go ahead and have an army of telescopes kind of looking at the same image. Okay, so the last slide. <laughs> there are so many, like, now they're, um, it's not a NASA thing. It's like a Google X game thing that are trying to kind of get people involved in sending, like, um, remote things to the moon. So who knows, All right? Okay, so let's take a break and resume about 35-ish or so, or so.